This serene, slow-moving, and strange-looking animal is a manatee. And this handsome fellow is its close relative, the dugong. They're air-breathing herbivores, the only aquatic mammals that exclusively eat plants. And both of them are endangered species. Dugongs cling to survival in a few isolated corners of the globe. And with only a few thousand Florida manatees remaining in the wild, the clock is ticking in efforts to save these amazing creatures from extinction. In Central Florida, a diverse group of biologists and wildlife officials capture manatees for health exams, census counts, and genetic testing. But safely securing a wild animal that can weigh more than a ton can be a challenge. With some recent conservation success and a baby boom of sorts, manatees are being considered for delisting from the Endangered Species Act. But would the controversial move be far too premature? Like many iconic species, manatees and dugongs have unlikely advocates, eco-tourists, many of them children. Manatees and dugongs' closest relatives are elephants. With thick, leathery hides and coarse hair, they are essentially aquatic pachyderms with matching appetites. Their spindle-shaped bodies slim down to enormous tails. The main difference between the two species are that dugongs' tails are fluke-shaped like a whale or dolphin, and manatees are round and paddle-shaped. They are indeed some of nature's more eccentric creations. These are Florida manatees, a distinct subspecies of the West Indian manatee. They are intensely curious, don't move very fast, and, for better or for worse, habituated to the presence of people. You can't go far in the Crystal River region of Central Florida without seeing a reference to manatees. They're even featured on license plates. But even though manatees are iconic animals, they're gravely threatened by a decades-long boom in wetland development and dramatic increases in human population. Each year, hundreds of manatees are killed in U.S. waters, mostly from boat strikes. Disease and cold weather also take a toll. 2006 was the worst year on record for manatee deaths. At least 416 perished. But things are looking up for manatees. The past few years has seen a baby boom. New births have helped to offset high mortality rates. We really want to have a balance, and we certainly want to have more calves born every year than animals are killed each year. And as long as we have that positive growth, then we're going to see the rewards associated with that in the population overall over time. It's when you get more manatees killed in one year where you have births that you present a problem. 
Today, biologist Dr. Bob Bondi is leading a massive effort to capture, examine, and release wild manatees. Animal health assessments are initiatives to help protect endangered manatees. And you need a lot of people to haul a 2,000-pound wild animal from the water. Representatives from local, state, and federal agencies are all on hand to help and to learn. So we're going to basically go over some of the ground rules. We have a lot of people here. We have a lot of activity that's going to be going on. Hopefully, we're going to have a lot of manatees. So why are we doing this? Why do we torment manatees and catch them? Well, this is a research project. The USGS is instructed to come in and learn as much as we can about the health of the manatees in the Crystal River National Wildlife Refuge. Fish and Wildlife Service mandates this, so it's good for recovery purposes to know how well manatees are doing. Manatees' preferred winter habitat is central Florida, and a lot of people live here, and many have boats. In Florida, when it gets cold, uh, manatees look for warm water sites, and so... I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Uh, the warmer the water, the better for these tropical manatees that are found in Florida and southeastern United States, the northern limit of their range. With all these people moving down into Florida and bringing their boats, there's a greater, greater burden on the manatees that use the same waterways the boats do. And so it's only a matter of time before a manatee gets scarred. It's not just the swirling propeller that causes the problems. In fact, only in 40% of the implicated deaths that are associated with watercraft mortality. In the other 60%, it's impact trauma. So you actually have boats that are going so fast through the water that they just come in and hit and, uh, and cause damage to manatees that's often lethal. In nearby Crystal River Wildlife Refuge, the team prepares their equipment and clears the beach of rocks and debris. We're going to be uh, supplying medical support and health support for the animals that are brought up, which means we'll be looking at their respiratory rates, we'll be looking at their heart rates, we'll be taking blood samples, we'll be checking areas of the blood that'll help us determine whether that animal is not getting enough oxygen. For those participants who've never experienced a manatee capture, it's a thrilling introduction to one of Florida's most revered species. We're looking for single animals so we don't set on too many. And, uh, and so the manatee goes into the net as it's swimming out. And you can see the footprint in the water right here as it goes into the middle of the net. that boat, deploy the net and a horseshoe around the manatee and then basically draw the manatee to shore. The net has a lead line and a float line. The lead line um, kind of digs up the bottom and the float line stays on top and we bag the animal up before it pulls to shore. Hull design is a malt skiff design. Um, the old malt fishing in the Florida used to use and we've modified it to our own needs by uh, having a removable transom and we took out a bulkhead. So now we're able to totally uh, set a net all the way around a manatee. Once the net is set, all hands are needed on the beach to wrangle the animal to shore. Stop with the float. Bring the floats this way. Yeah. Open it up. You're okay. Just let that stay down. Okay. Step back with the float. Open it up a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Slow down on the float. Float, 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 Beautiful. It is a team effort because we're manhandling an elephant-sized animal. It takes a lot of people to pick up an elephant and tote it around. Now, an elephant, you can train to walk over here and plop down and, and take your blood sample. A manatee's taken out of the water. It's got to be carried. So it takes a bunch of us. Yeah. The tail, just a little weight on the...
That's it. Your hands on the animal, though. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna roll the animal to its on its right side. And we're gonna tuck the net and tuck the stretcher. Okay. All right, everybody, ready? We're going right onto the foam. One, two, three. Good. Hands on the animal. All right, it's all yours. Thanks. <laughs> good job. Once again, good job. The first animal caught had distinct scarring from a boat strike. What are you doing there, Bob? Um, well, we're just documenting the scar pattern. So you can see that the uh, skeg mark is on the bottom half of this animal. And the propeller, as it swirled, ended up hitting the back and caused this really distinct scar. So what this enables us to do is keep um, okay, which, an identity uh, we'll for this way? individual so we can follow it over time and we'll be able to monitor um, its survival from one year to the next. The first manatee capture was a success and a valuable learning experience. But it took too long. The team will have to speed up the process. It's a huge task to organize so many people and resources. It takes time, and they have just two days to complete their work. The animals are generally not happy to be captured in nets and hauled on shore, and some protest a little more strongly than others. Floats in, floats in, bag it, bag it, bag it. Most of the manatees put up quite a struggle, and light as a feather, they're not. They're heavy, and they, they get bigger. These, these guys have been in um, kind of the bigger range, but they can definitely tip the scales even, even heavier. We rescued one back in March of uh, 2007 in Daytona Beach. It was 2,700 pounds, and that was a, a large animal to catch. That's why you can see out here today, uh, it takes a lot of people, a lot of coordinated efforts to get these guys safely caught on shore, worked up, and then back in the water. One, two, three. This big male has never been captured and is unknown to the team. I'm not sure he's in the catalog, so this will be a new cataloged animal. There's just mild scarring on his back. He has remnants of barnacle scars on his body, which, is, which means he's been out in the salt water good portion of the, uh, the season. So this may be a transient male that's moving through the area, which is unique and genetically will be very interesting for us to look at. Right now we're just keeping an eye on the tail area. It's probably the most dangerous part of the animal. They have a lot of strength in their paddle. And uh, so if the animal starts to roll or something, we want to make sure we can get weight on it really quickly. OK, now we're going to feed this underneath the head okay. and out in front of the head. We're going to look at blood values, and we're going to see how healthy the animal is. We're going to look at the immunology. We want to know what the stress levels are in the animals. But we want to try to make a composite picture of what's happened to this animal in the more recent history, but even over the long term. It's one giant puzzle with a bunch of different pieces that's going to put together the status and health and welfare of these animals that are out there. I've got to tell you, first thing you always want to do is scan the animal. You don't want to put more much. A challenge facing Andy Garrett and the rest of the team is to positively identify each manatee and find out if the animal was previously captured. One of the key tools in their arsenal is a tiny electronic ID device called a pit tag. Sticking. We uh, insert microchips in case we ever catch the animal again. We know we've had it handled it before. In case it comes in rescued um, or dead, we know where we've handled it before. The manatees are first checked for existing pit tags. If none are found, the animal is prepared for a minor surgical procedure to insert the device. The microchip itself is no larger than a grain of rice and is implanted with a modified syringe. The pit tag is then registered in a database. Zero, 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 six, nine, six, C2, eight E. Eight E? Yes. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. How's he doing? On shore, the manatees instinctively hold their breath. 
but under stress, their CO2 levels can rise dangerously high. The animals are induced to breathe by simply dousing them with water. We want to encourage him to take breaths, and we want to give him oxygen. So we literally have an oxygen valve that we put right in front of his nose, and as he inhales, he's, he takes up some of that oxygen, and it helps to keep that CO2 and oxygen balance pretty even. Blood work is perhaps the most valuable part of the health exam. Like humans, manatee blood analysis reveals vital information about the animal's well-being. Core samples are sent out to various labs for testing and cataloging. But with a new high-tech device, much of the work can be done on site. We call it an iStat machine. It measures blood gas, and what that means is we can get a blood sample from the animal, and it gives us the pH, and it tells us their CO2 level, their oxygen level. It also tells us their lactate. It just literally takes a few drops. A small tissue sample is cut from the tail for DNA analysis. In this Crystal River greater population, we've collected over 700 cookie samples from manatees. So we have a really good representation genetically of the stock population. Two, three. A necessary and unenviable task is to collect urine and fecal samples. You can tell a lot about a manatee from what comes out of a manatee. What we've got here is a fecal sample from the first male manatee that just got brought up on the shore. And um, my professor at UF uses these to look for hormone concentrations and sex steroids in the uh, manatees. You can tell a lot from a fecal sample, apparently. <laughs> Right now we're doing the measurements, uh, straight line, curvilinear, total length, and then we'll do some girths. 252 for straight line, and then ISCA, curvilinear. Nearly all of the manatees captured and examined were exceptionally healthy. But one of the last animals to be caught appeared to have suffered serious trauma. It did not struggle in the nets at all. It was either injured, weak, or very sick. A boat strike likely caused severe scarring and internal injuries. Fresh, deep wounds were not a good sign. The team must now decide whether to evacuate the animal to a medical facility or to release it. So we want to get his weight, we want to see if this injury is serious enough to have caused debilitation, and then we probably want to sample a couple of these little lesions on the body. Well, this manatee was actually uh, hit by a boat very recently, and, and in this area right here, we were actually noticing that there was uh, some swelling, and we're concerned that there might be some deep tissue swelling and also some bone involvement, so by putting an ultrasound probe on here, we're able to very quickly um, assess that there actually is deep tissue swelling here and possibly some bone involvement on the edge. Um, nothing that's so drastic that we might want to think that he immediately needs to go into rehabilitation, but it's something that we would want to monitor um, out in the wild over time. One of the last orders of business in the manatee health exams was to weigh the animals. One, two, three, oh! Clear. Call it, someone back there, call it. 16, 10, 6, 25. 16, 25. Coming down. After two days of intense work, the last of the manatees was examined and released. It was a very successful endeavor, and the team learned a great deal about Crystal River's wild manatee population. But why do we do this? You know, why do we care that manatees are around? And I think it is real important. I think that I've been blessed with the opportunity to learn from manatees and to get out there in my research career to do this. I would love to pass it on to other researchers, but I'd also like to pass it on to my kids and their generation. One, two, three. One, two, three. 
know, when I started 30 years ago, we were just writing the books about manatee biology. And though we've written some really interesting works, we've learned a lot about manatees. But there's new things right on the horizon. You know, these animals don't cease to amaze me. Some rescued manatees are too severely injured to be released back into the wild. But how do you care for a really big aquatic animal with an even bigger appetite? If a manatee survives a boat strike or is incapacitated by disease or cold stress, Florida has a number of facilities which care for sick or injured animals. Homosassa Springs Wildlife State Park is one of a handful of centers in Florida that rehabilitates manatees and provides some of them with permanent homes. In captivity, the animals need intensive care and a lot of food. Homosassa Springs Wildlife State Park is sort of an animal sanctuary. What we have are injured animals, animals that have nowhere else to go, and animals that have actually been confiscated in some cases. The manatees that are here, they probably couldn't survive on their own. Volunteers and park staff get into the water each day with resident manatees. Okay. mostly sedentary lifestyle and a rich diet has helped to push the manatees' weights a bit towards the hefty side. These guys being captive animals, uh, most of them have been captive animals, are brought in for rehab for a number of years, so they're not going through that annual migratory amount of effort they have to put in. They're also not going through the just having to look for your food on a daily basis. Of course, in the wild, they're not going to be eating a lot of sweet potatoes, that we need something that's a little bit of bribery, basically, to get them in and make sure we can get a good look at them every morning. No eating rope. No rope. Uh, this is Amanda, actually. Amanda's one of the injury cases that came in. Um, as you can see here, she's got some really deep prop cuts. And those actually go all the way down along her side. Now, Amanda got caught in a lock system and she got locked in with a boat as they drained the water down. She was basically pinned up against the boat, bounced off of it, and into the side of the propeller. And this is Rosie. This is actually the largest animal. And you can see the scar on her head. That's the reason she's here. She took a direct strike across the top of her head. Last year, of course, was a real bad year for boat strikes. Um, the propellers actually cause a lot of damage. The boat strikes themselves cause a lot of the deaths. Uh, all this tissue up here is lung. So when manatees are hit by a boat, you're cutting into the lungs. A chest full of water on a person, a manatee, any kind of mammal, it's a drowning. Here at Homosassa, we've got only female manatees uh, just because we don't allow captive breeding. Actually, captive breeding is not allowed anywhere. And the reason is female manatees spend several years raising their calves, teaching them pretty much where to go to get food, where to go to get water temperature, and also where to go to get fresh water. And that's not something we can teach them here. Manatee's closest land relative or closest genetic relative is the elephant. You do see some similarities. They do have that prehensile upper lip, which is basically just a shrunken down, modified version of an elephant's trunk. They also have the same toenails that elephants have. So you got those rounded off. Not much good for digging or, or clawing, but they do have toenails on there. Uh, and they also nurse their young in the same place, which would be in the armpit area or the, the flipper pit area on a manatee. So there are quite a few similarities between the two. At the park, rescued animals have many friends. They're personable, they're gentle, they can be demanding. <laughs> it's a very cool volunteer position. I've lived here full time for three years now, 
and I've been at the park for about two years. So it's a really great, I never even heard of manatees till I got here. <laughs> now they're about my favorite critter. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cindy. I'm a volunteer here with the Florida Park Service. The manatees at Homosassa Springs are very popular tourist attractions. And as long as the food keeps coming, the animals are happy to oblige appreciative audiences. Observatory at Homosassa provides a remarkable glimpse into the underwater realm of a Florida spring. And here the manatees get their main meals for the day. These guys will get romaine, they'll get kale, they'll get cabbage. Uh, iceberg lettuce is basically green water, so we don't feed that. The romaine for them is probably one of the higher proteins. They'll get peppers, they'll get, spinning on the day, kale, bok choy, bananas actually are one of their favorites, and they'll also get about 50 pounds of carrots a day. Keeping the park's manatees healthy and well-fed is a never-ending chore. Our manatees here at the park eat a lot of food four times a day, so this is pretty much an all-day event every single day of the year. So a lot of the research as far as manatee diets and what their, their dietary needs are comes from research with actually elephants, being that elephants have been captive a lot longer than manatees actually, so they know a lot more about the nutritional needs of elephants. Manatees, even though they're called sea cows, internally they're basically horses. So they're similar to another animal that we know a lot more about. In the wild, active manatees eat even more food. They can ingest hundreds of pounds of vegetation daily, up to 10% of their body weight. They do offer us a service. We're out there with these same boats that run them over. We like to keep the waterways clean. Manatees feed on the plants. They're grazers, and they're doing us a public service by keeping waterways clear. The big thing with manatees, they're the only marine herbivore. So if you take an animal that's doing something like that, which is removing plants from an ecosystem on a natural basis, if you take those completely out of the equation, what you're gonna get is massive overgrowth of lots of plants and choked off rivers and waterways. And we really don't know exactly what the impact of the amount of plant life they take out of the ecosystem is. If they were gone completely, we might never know how well they manage this ecosystem. For a more hands-on approach to manatee ecotourism, you can snorkel with the animals in the wild. They crave attention and a good belly scratch. of winter, it's cold, and it's way too early. But still, hundreds of bleary-eyed tourists, many of them children, descend on Crystal River and other waterways where manatees live. They come to see and interact with manatees in their natural habitat. Okay, take three more over here, guys. The best time is the morning time to see the manatees. That's when we get the best interaction out of the manatees. Um, later in the afternoon, they start feeding. They could care less about us, so we want to get out there early. Let's go over a couple of rules that we went over yesterday, just to make sure we're all on the same page. We want to be as quiet as possible, right? That is the most important thing. It's cold out there this morning, so the manatees should be plentiful. They like to be scratched on their belly underneath their flippers. Stay completely on the surface. The manatees have to come to us. If we go diving down and there's a manatee on the bottom, he's either sleeping or feeding. We don't want to mess with him. Typical weekend. Lots of people, lots of kids. 
gets a little crowded, yes. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? That's a debate that could go forever. In my opinion, it's a good thing. It's getting education to our youth, and that's what we need to do. Um, it's just going to go a long ways in protecting the species. There's more awareness. And the awareness is taking place in this younger generation. And these are the people that are going to be responsible for taking good care of not only us when we get older, but the manatees that are out there. So it's very encouraging that young people get interested in this stuff. This water environment that we have around us is almost as alien as another planet. And it shouldn't be. We've got animals the size of elephants 10 feet away from us wandering along the shore. We don't see them because they're under the water. So I think anybody that gets in the water swims with manatees, sees them in that natural environment, comes out a better person for that experience. The manatees are almost like cows and dogs crossed together underwater. Yeah, and then can... like when you try and pet them, they'll roll over like a dog so you can scratch their belly. When you pet them, they're really rough and they don't feel all that great. They feel like yeah. algae. Like yeah. Tiny, like, yeah, they, they like, have that like algae layer like, Yeah, like on shells the and algae yeah. and like slimy, scaly. It's nasty. Rough. Like the calves make these really high pitched noises. Squeals. Yeah. Squeals. And it's kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a giant kindergarten class got mad in the pool. It's a lot of fun. It's just an incredible feeling when you're in the water with 212 year olds. Manatees swim over and they roll over in their belly. The kids rub their belly just like a big pet dog, eh? And they're, you can hear the kids giggling underwater. It, it's a great experience. Every school should bring kids down to something like this. Did everybody have a good time? Yeah! Lots of manatees? Oh, yeah. yeah. How many would you say you saw? Ecotourism of this sort could be a very powerful source of conservation. Most of the visitors who come to this refuge are children. And children are exposed to the tri-dimensional world of a manatee. And they do see how manatees behave and move underwater. And they gain a, more, a better appreciation. Sometimes they use the word love, that they end up loving these animals. Ivan Vicente is just one of a handful of wildlife officials charged with protecting manatees. Some in the conservation community feel that manatee tourism, especially the widely condoned practice of touching the animals, has gone a bit too far. That's why we try to encourage passive observation so that when people are in the water, they try to establish some distance so that they can view from a distance and have more quality experience when swimming with a manatee. We just want to get away from a petting zoo concept or a park. It's a wildlife refuge and manatees should be treated as the wild creatures they are by people allowing them to have the right of way and letting them do what they want to do. Aerial tour is a good way to find manatees and to see some of the impacts of an ever-increasing human population. <laughs> hey, good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? I'm doing great. Good. How about you guys? Yeah, we're gonna go find some manatees today. Over. Tour boats go about their daily business near the manatee sanctuaries where the animals are protected. But from the air, the amount of nearby shoreline development is staggering. And right in the midst of the canal lots, boats, and enormous homes are hundreds of manatees. The human population has grown very rapidly. It's a very desirable place to come down and live in Florida and to bring your boats and to live right on the water. Those kinds of uh, burdens on the society of having 1,000 people a day moving in and living and occupying Florida habitat is putting a greater drain on the habitat that's out there in the environment. And this is the same habitat and environment that's, that is utilized by manatees. With our growing population in Florida, more and more people, greater demands on the freshwater resources, we've tapped water out of the aquifer. So it's flow reductions at even Crystal River and all of the other natural artesian springs that we've been monitoring is down significantly from historical periods. And in fact, it's even projected that in the next 10 and 20 years, reduction of some of these springs may fall 10, 
And that's a substantial amount less of warm water coming out that manatees will have available. Nearby Homosassa River and its springs have seen even more dramatic losses in water volume over the past few years. We were once a six million gallon an hour spring, now we're a two million gallon an hour spring. And what you have is just water being used uh, for agriculture, for golf courses, and uh, for housing. So it's taking water directly out of the source. We don't have enough warm water here for manatees. And Mother Nature designed them to live around the equator in the tropics. Um, then Florida and the southeastern United States is not becoming a very suitable place to have manatees. On the other side of the globe, dugongs face similar challenges in their struggle to survive. And just like Florida, some of their staunchest advocates are children. a world away from the freshwater springs and rivers of Central Florida is the United Arab Emirates. This Middle Eastern country is a study in contrasts. Stark desert terrain, explosive urban growth, and the rich marine ecosystem of the Arabian Gulf. And this is one of the places where dugongs live. Dugongs are found along the coastlines of over 35 countries. The two largest populations are centered off Western Australia and the Arabian Gulf. Unlike manatees, dugongs spend their entire lives in saltwater. There are more dugongs than manatees in the world, but they are spread out over a much larger geographic area. They are still considered an endangered species. And like manatees, dugongs face daunting challenges in their struggle for survival, especially pressures from a growing human population. The growth in the last 30 years has been tremendous. The population of uh, United Arab Emirates as a whole in 1968 was about less than 200,000. Today we are talking about 5 million people. Most of them are living along the coastal belt. This. Uh, creates a tremendous uh, challenge for us. We have a number of very important habitats and very important species, some of which have uh, global importance, uh, like the dugongs and the sea turtles. It is our duty, it's an international duty, for us to protect these dugongs. Dugongs are frequently struck and killed by speeding boats. But the animals live in the open ocean, and do not have to navigate congested waterways like manatees do. Boats are not their greatest threat. The most serious obstacle they face is the development and dredging of their coastline habitat. This is where lush beds of seagrass are found. Just like their North American cousins, dugongs need a lot of food. Because seagrasses are generally very low in nutritional value, they have to eat constantly, and dugongs roam over vast areas of the ocean floor in search of food. In traditional wooden dows, dugongs were historically hunted for their succulent meat. But since the 1960s, they've been a protected species. Fishermen used to use handheld harpoons to capture and kill the animals. The government of the United Arab Emirates has since drafted comprehensive and far-sighted legislation in regards to marine conservation and dugongs continue to be one of their top priorities. All right, children, what is this animal called? Dugong. What 
What is it called? Dugong. It is the most important animal because there are very few left. Marine protected areas and strong awareness campaigns are helping to protect dugongs. Children are also introduced to the marine environment by scientists who visit local schools. Students are also encouraged to participate in hands-on field trips. We have more than 120,000 students we work with in different schools, and we have different programs, and we have also uh, educational program for marine environment. Learn more about the biodiversity and learn more about the ecosystem they live in. But still, we have more to do. We will know that if we've been effective or not when they grow up and start living within this ecosystem. Awareness campaigns in the United Arab Emirates appear to be working. After decades of sharp decline, the dugongs of Abu Dhabi are showing encouraging signs of recovery. Getting the message out to new generations has proven to be a key tool in marine conservation. Back in central Florida, manatee numbers seem to have stabilized and are perhaps even growing. But is it far too early to remove them from the Endangered Species Act? Florida manatees have no natural enemies and are believed to live up to 60 years or more. Current estimates indicate a stable but small population of perhaps 4,000 animals. They are still very much at risk. Manatees mature and reproduce slowly. They generally give birth to a single calf only once every three years. And with few offspring to replace animals killed, the population doesn't recover easily. Sanctuaries and restricted manatee zones have been created throughout Florida, and warning signs are posted in waterways frequented by both the mammals and by boat traffic. Aggressive public relations work and media attention is getting the message out, and snorkeling with manatees is helping to foster a new generation of passionate advocates for manatee conservation. I had someone once come up to me and say, you know, I wasn't here for dinosaurs. Why do my kids have to see manatees? And I think, you know, it's really kind of sad we didn't see dinosaurs. They'd be magnificent animals to work with and to study and to see on this planet. Likewise, we can do very little on our part and still have manatees around, but it means making a sacrifice. So the big question is, are you willing to make a sacrifice for something in your environment? And a lot of people will say no, but I think it's against our human nature not to try. Stabilizing the manatee population and increasing their numbers is a goal shared by many in Florida. And the animals are doing relatively well. Like the bald eagle and other species which were removed from the Endangered Species Act, manatees are being considered for delisting. But there is close to unanimous opposition to the controversial move. Is it far too early to remove them from the act? The state agencies essentially realized that there were probably more manatees in Florida than we've had, and so the prognosis was that you'd had a pretty good developing, growing population. The feds have followed suit with that kind of rationale and logic as well, and made recommendations. And generally, the models you have are the best assumption of what's happened to a population in the past, and predicting what's going to happen in the future. And that's fine if everything stays status quo and nothing changes. But we know every day it's a ticking bomb with manatees, that things are changing that are unprecedented, have not happened to manatees before. If you look in the near future, manatees have done pretty well. Is that a reason to take them off the list? Right now, they're afforded the protection of an endangered species. They also have a lot of sanctuaries set aside for them because they're an endangered species. Delisting them would, for one, make those sanctuaries possible areas to be developed. And that would take away more habitat for them and potentially cause a lot of problems for the animals that are recovering. There are some pretty large lobbying groups in Florida that want to see them changed from endangered to threatened on the listing status. And they have their own agendas and their own reasons for that, but 
in our particular case, we're definitely not looking for that to happen, hoping that it doesn't. You have lobbying industry that one extreme say, I want to go fast in my boat, I have that right, you shouldn't be imposing any restrictions on me. And then the other group says, well, we shouldn't even have boats out there in the first place. Let's restore it back to the way it was before people came on the planet. And both are extreme. So what you have to do is kind of meet in the middle. Manatees are luckily still on the endangered species list. For now, manatees and dugongs are holding their own, but they continue to face many challenges. When hunting, most undersea predators rely on razor-sharp teeth, lightning speed, or brute force. But there are also creatures that feed and defend themselves with more subtle but no less effective weapons. For many animals, survival depends on a powerful discharge of venom. Poisons of certain marine species are among the most lethal found in nature. The sting of a box jellyfish or stonefish can inflict excruciating pain and even kill a human. In an ironic twist, these potent toxins are now sources of new wonder drugs. Deadly cone snails have helped researchers discover innovative ways to treat severe pain and a host of other human ailments. For these seemingly defenseless animals, life hinges on their lethal arsenals of venom. of every shape and description weave a living tapestry. This is the enchanting realm of the tropical reef. In this undersea city, the struggle to survive is the driving force behind the lives of all creatures. Many animals are both predators and prey, and one of the most effective tools for survival is venom. Some species use conspicuous, even flamboyant displays to advertise their toxins, while others rely on more subtle means to eat or not to be eaten. Of the many creatures which utilize venom, only a handful are deadly to humans. Undersea animals, sea snakes have one of the most potent toxins. Their venoms are far more powerful than those of most terrestrial snakes. Just a few drops are enough to kill a human. 
Many divers and swimmers have had the unnerving experience of a curious sea snake approaching or even touching them. For humans, there's really very little danger unless the snake feels threatened. They're a wonderful animal to work with under the water because they're not threatened by us, and so we can handle them as long as you're, as long as you're gentle and they don't feel stressed, then they're really a very easy animal to work with. Dr. Glenn Burns is one of the world's foremost sea snake specialists. Over the past two decades, he has captured and studied hundreds of the animals. His research has helped to dispel many of the myths surrounding these intriguing creatures. The danger to humans from sea snakes has been greatly exaggerated. They are far less likely to bite us than virtually any venomous snake. And unlike other deadly species, they can be safely handled. The inquisitive reptiles look at divers as just another piece of reef to explore in a search for their favorite foods. We are clearly a greater threat to them than they are to us. take her out of the bag, measure him, and uh, we'll check him for a tag. Yep, no worries. Come on, that should come. This one's actually a male. The males actually don't grow as big as the females, but this is, this is a big male. Right. So what we might do is we'll pop him up here on the, on the bench, and uh, if I hold the body in, I'll get you to handle the rest of the body, and we'll just, uh, we'll measure him. Yep, no worries. And we'll get a length on him. Yep, yep. Because sea snakes have little fear of man and are relatively easy to capture, they are often killed for their meat and skins. Motorboats and fishing trawlers also take a heavy toll. Trapped in nets, the air-breathing snakes easily drown. In a number of areas of the Indo-Pacific, sea snake numbers are declining dramatically. You can read it off at the vent there. Oh, she's cranky. Yeah. I want to get a, a snout vent measurement, so if I hold the tape here, yep. so can you just read it off on the vent? Yeah, it's a 1.25 snout oh. vent. Oh, she's wriggling. Okay, so that's a 1.25 snout vent. Beautiful. All right. All right, now, see when she starts to twist like yep. this, when it's better to put her down because I don't want to damage her. Okay, lay her body down. Yep. And Backs let off. her go. Because um, they're actually, the, the vertebrae in here are really delicate. Right. So if I actually hold her and she starts to twist, if I hold her too hard, it'll actually dislocate the vertebrae in her neck. So it's better to lay her down, back away, let her calm down, and then start again. People who are usually uh, bitten by snakes are handling them, either on deck, the way we have been, or uh, fishermen trying to get them out of nets, for example. When someone is bitten by a sea snake, the rapid use of antivenom is crucial in helping the victim survive potentially fatal symptoms. Burns milks the snakes of their poison, which is then sent back to serum labs to be developed into antivenoms. Okay, so she gave most of her venom then, just in one bite. You can see it there in the bottom of the glass. And that's a lethal dose. That's enough to kill us both. If she bit me now, she's still potentially capable of delivering a lethal dose of venom, even though we've just milked her. 
when she bites you, you, you don't really know how much venom that uh, she's pumped into you. It may be a dry bite. I was bitten once before, and, uh, and it was a dry bite. I, wasn't, I was bitten but not envenomated. And you don't know. You don't know whether you have any venom in you until you start to show symptoms. Okay, so if you, uh, if you can take her head, I'll just... Uh, think. You right there? I'm down. Beautiful. You right? Right? Yeah, I got it. You right? Yep. To distinguish individual snakes, Burns utilizes an electronic microchip called a pit tag. With a minor surgical procedure, he inserts the tiny device directly into the animal's body. There it goes there. Okay. With a database of hundreds of snakes, Burns can track their migrations along the Australian coast and help identify animals killed in fishing nets or by boats. Very nice. With much of sea snake behavior and biology a mystery, there still remains a lot to learn about the enigmatic reptiles. One of the reasons that we know so little about sea snakes is the fact that they are so venomous. People tend to shy away from them. A potentially dangerous animal like that um, doesn't really lend itself to close observation. I've been working with sea snakes for 20 years now and, and I'll continue to work with sea snakes. I, I still find them fascinating. There's so much we don't know about them. I mean, so far we've been able to track some individuals, but uh, uh, we've only been able to do it with like one species and there are so many more species to work with. So, you know, I'll, I'll continue to work with sea snakes, absolutely. Whoa, that's a very cranky snake. <laughs> the venom of this marine animal is also one of the strongest toxins on Earth. But its deadly poison is also giving new hope to patients suffering from acute pain. Australia's Great Barrier Reef, stretching for over 1,200 miles along the country's eastern coast, the reef is the largest community of living organisms on Earth. To study one of the ocean's most poisonous animals, researchers from the University of Queensland travel from the port city of Gladstone to remote Heron Island. Located at the extreme southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef, Heron Island is a renowned bird sanctuary. It's also a staging point and research center for scientists from around the globe. This particular mission, to collect deadly cone snails and extract their lethal toxins. On a milligram per milligram basis, the venom of this tiny marine mollusk is one of the strongest poisons found in nature. Coveted for their beautiful shells, 
many collectors, divers, and beach walkers have discovered that the attractive snails pack a powerful punch. They've been the cause of hundreds of serious injuries and several documented deaths. Their venom is strong enough to paralyze or kill a human. In the envenomation process, most individuals feel a sharp pain. They have a feeling of loss of control of uh, body function. Their blood pressure can either go up or down. They have trouble moving, trouble breathing. Give you some oxygen. We're going to take good take care of you. Don't worry. The neurotoxins of certain cone snails are so powerful that they can cause the human respiratory system to shut down. While fully conscious and aware, many victims lose the ability to breathe or the heart simply stops beating. Dr. Paul Aylwood is a professor at the University of Queensland and a founding member of the Xenome Project. Xenome is a pioneering leader in the research and development of new medicines derived from the venom of toxic animals. And the venom of the cone snail is likely the world's richest treasure trove of new drugs. With over 50,000 different toxic proteins, or peptides, the cone snail family promises the most important pharmacology of any animal species. With the right dosage and combination of peptide molecules, these poisons appear to be highly effective in the treatment of a number of human ailments. Each canotoxin uh, impacts upon a different nerve system in humans. Some of these relate to pain, others to blood pressure, others to mood, uh, and others to muscle control. So they're a, a huge source of potential drugs. Australia is home to 100 of the world's nearly 600 species of cone snails. Heron Island, with its immense surrounding reef, is an ideal collection site. We'll go out, uh, straight out there. I think it's going to be another half an hour. Yeah, I think so. It'll be half an hour to get out to there, in any case, so... OK, well, the tide's still a fair way to go. Going to head out there? So, the... let's, let's stop and have a look where we're going. Where's that pointer? Yeah, the marker. During extremely low tides, Aylwood and his colleagues fan out across the shallow reef to search for cone snails. Let's do it. Oh, beautiful. Nice one, guys, over here. Capitanus lives on top of the rocks and you can see by the growth on the shell, whereas underneath it's all nice and shiny. and shiny, living under the rock. Mm hmm straight under that uh, Kind of sand. striatus. Mm hmm The researchers need only gather one or two snails of any given species. Their toxins can then be analyzed, sequenced, and replicated in a lab. The collection of a small number of animals has a negligible impact on mollusk populations. It's a Bernius or a Braeus. Good. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a young snapper. No, there's nothing there. It's certainly the unglamorous bit of canned honey. After dark, the animals are more active as they leave their coral hideaways to feed. At 2 a.m., the crew returns to the reef to search for the nocturnal hunters. Well, with a bit of luck, they're cruising around in the evening. In principle, it's, <clears throat> they should all be awake and, uh, and out. In practice, it's pretty hard to see them in any case. There's a 
little fish under there. Cone snails prey on worms, other mollusks, and fish. And it's the species that hunt fish that are most deadly to humans. As we are also vertebrates, like fish, these toxins unfortunately target our physiology. The mollusks can smell their quarry from a considerable distance. Their mantle is drawn out and forms a siphon through which water enters, providing respiration, but also alerting them to the presence of their prey. And at night, most fish are asleep. Closing in on a goby, the slow-moving snail readies its deadly harpoon. In seconds, the fish is immobilized, and the mollusk wastes no time in ingesting the huge meal. satisfy the snail's hunger for several days. At the research station, scientists extract tiny venom glands of various cone snails. It's a laborious process and difficult work. Powerful microscopes reveal a close-up look at the snail's barbed weapons. There, wow. Look at this. Real fishing hook. The mollusk's arsenal includes dozens of tiny harpoons. A bit more defined. The barbs are tethered to their body and packed with enough venom to paralyze or kill their prey. Cone snails are indeed one of nature's most brilliant and deadly designs. Queensland's largest city, Xenome utilizes cutting-edge technology to extract and synthesize the venoms of cone snails and other highly poisonous animals. One of Australia's deadly killers, the funnel web spider, is also a potential source of new drugs. Its poison can be milked by gently stimulating the animal. Rearing up and exposing its large fangs, the spider discharges a lethal venom. Principal scientists at Xenome combine skills in genomics, chemistry, and pharmacology in the pursuit of medicines based on animal toxins. The researchers have a particular interest in cone snails. The poisons of these beautiful mollusks are becoming the holy grail of new drugs. The toxic molecules, or peptides, of cone snails work by disrupting communications between different cell groups. By blocking these transmissions, conotoxins can effectively treat a wide variety of ailments. They've got many hundreds of different peptides, and what we do is take out one or two and isolate them, work at their activity, synthesize them chemically, and then we can test them in people. Venom's research has a very bright future, we believe, because it's got the potential to treat diseases that are presently untreatable. We can really now start to get very excited about the potential of these to treat a much wider range of disease. Depression, epilepsy, autoimmune diseases and acute pain are only a few of the areas in which cone snail venoms appear to hold great promise. Scientists at Xenome have isolated peptides from the venom of nearly a hundred species of cone snails. Remarkably, their toxins are far more potent and effective than morphine and other opiates 
And best of all, they're non-addictive. The future of this research is pretty exciting. The main reason I do this work is to discover new things. Uh, as a traditional chemist, we used to design new drugs from scratch. Every time we work with a venom, we discover a potent new molecule with potential drug use. It's fantastic. To find many of the ocean's deadliest animals, you have to travel to some remote places. One of the most remote is Papua New Guinea. There is no better place in the world to find the sea's most venomous creatures than Papua New Guinea. Poised near the Earth's epicenter of coral reef biodiversity, the region is home to a staggering variety of poisonous animals. This nearly invisible invertebrate is the most toxic species of them all, the box jellyfish. They are responsible for more fatalities and serious injuries to humans than all other creatures in the sea combined, including sharks. Box jellyfish are a deadly presence in the tropical Pacific. The box jellyfish is of all the different venomous marine creatures, it is the most venomous marine creature. The poisonous part of the animal is gonna be a set of tentacles. And these tentacles contain uh, specialized cells called nematocytes. It's these nematocytes that um, actually cause the sting and cause the envenomation. The toxin produced by the uh, box jellyfish is a neurotoxin, it acts uh, on the transmission of nerve impulses from the nerve to the muscle. Victims that are stung by the jellyfish will have difficulty breathing and can go into a respiratory arrest. The poison can also affect the heart and go into cardiac arrest. Dr. Gary Ronay is an expert on highly toxic marine animals. His search for species like the cone snail and box jellyfish frequently bring him to places like Papua New Guinea. Oh, this is a nice one. This venom is, is a, a, what's called a neurotoxin. Mm -hmm. It actually blocks the transmission of the nerve impulse from the nerve to the muscle. Mm -hmm. So effectively, it, it paralyzes the muscle. As a matter of fact, in, in some cases, the poison is so powerful that the person is transferred to a hospital. They have to put on a, on a breathing machine, a ventilator. Oh, wow. But it's an extremely powerful poison, very interesting poison, too. The waters of uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, the Indo-Pacific area, has the greatest biodiversity of marine life in the whole world. And the greatest number of species are concentrated in very small areas. This biodiversity offers the diver a tremendous opportunity to see the most beautiful creatures in the world. Many of these are venomous and potentially dangerous, but they all play a role in the ecosystem. Many fish in the sea utilize venom, but most do so for defensive purposes only. These harmless looking creatures are marine catfish. They school together in a tightly packed group, appearing almost as a single animal. But they also have a hidden defense mechanism. They are highly venomous. 
dorsal and pectoral spines are packed with a lethal cocktail. Believe it or not, these tiny fish have caused human fatalities. This strange animal is a demon stinger. Beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but there are likely few who would find this creature attractive. It is still sometimes referred to appropriately as a ghoul or devil fish. Everything about it is odd. It can swim, but its preferred method of travel is walking. With foot-like appendages, it shuffles along the bottom. stinger is part of a very large extended family named Scorpinidae, more commonly known as scorpion fish. Distributed worldwide in virtually all seas, scorpion fish come in a dazzling variety of shapes, sizes, and potency. venom-laden spines are very effective defensive tools. But to eat, scorpion fish rely mostly on camouflage and lightning quick speed. Some species are highly territorial. There is no room on this reef for two male scorpion fish. After a prolonged match of nose-to-nose -nose posturing, the two adversaries prime themselves for a fight. Locking on his foe, both animals rest. But after a few minutes, the jousting continues. This contest can last for hours. Not all scorpion fish are drab or ugly. Several members of this family are very striking animals. Their finery has inspired many names, such as turkey, lion, or zebra fish. Like most scorpion fish, their dorsal and pectoral fins are loaded with poison. Venom sacs at the base of their spines discharge a potent toxin at the slightest touch. Favorites in the global aquarium trade, many hobbyists have learned firsthand that this is one beautiful fish that you do not want to handle. This gruesome fellow is a stonefish, the most venomous fish in the sea. An envenomation from a stonefish or any of its related fish, any of the scorpion fishes at all, is extremely painful. A colleague of mine was envenomated by a stonefish, so when we had to race him off for first aid and get medical attention, so I know firsthand just how much pain a person can experience from stonefish, almost to the point where you lose any rational thinking. The way a stonefish envenomates you is the physical pressure of stepping on the spines ruptures the skin and then 
the pressure of your foot pushing down upon the spine compresses the venom sacs and the venom gets into you. This colleague of mine who was envenomated by a stonefish and the intense pain, I can imagine someone who didn't have the same strength of character as he did may well have wanted to end their life rather than continue experiencing the pain. At the Australian Institute of Marine Science, Dr. Lyndon Llewellyn studies marine toxins and the animals that produce them. Australia, with a much larger population than New Guinea, bears the brunt of serious envenomations in the tropical Pacific. If you're interested in venomous animals, Australia is a paradise. We have some of the most venomous mollusks in the world, some of the most venomous jellyfish in the world. People shouldn't get the wrong impression that getting out of bed in the morning and going for a swim is a dangerous thing to do. Envenomations and fatalities and poisonings from marine animals are rare, probably rarer than car accidents. Many jellyfish are poisonous, but on a tiny island in the South Pacific, this species evolved to survive in fresh water and lost its venom. In the Western Pacific lies a vast region known as Micronesia. It is not a singular country or island, but rather an immense oceanic territory that contains over 2,200 islands. Collectively, they span an area greater than the land mass of the continental United States. The tiny country of Palau is located on the far western fringe of Micronesia. Like emerald jewels in a turquoise sea, its massive lagoon is sprinkled with picturesque islands. One of the most compelling underwater ecosystems here is not part of the ocean. In the thick jungle of one of Palau's rock islands exists a strange aquatic phenomenon. Seismic upheaval caused a small portion of the lagoon to become trapped in the center of the island. This eventually isolated the lake from the surrounding ocean. Jellyfish Lake is a brackish lagoon that is home to over 100,000 non-stinging jellyfish. A few species of fish and two types of jellyfish adapted to the decreasing salinity, evolving certain unique characteristics. Most importantly, the invertebrates lost their venom. Over the millennia, the jellyfish developed a symbiotic relationship with algae. Algae is sustained by the energy of the sun. The plants live in the body of the jellyfish and provide sustenance to their mobile hosts. The jellyfish carry the algae around the lake, following the sun's rays to maximize production of new plants. It's an unusual yet productive alliance of two very different species. Unlike their marine counterparts, these animals have no use for venom. They initially had no predators and didn't need to sting their food, so evolution eventually relieved them of their weapons. They're perfectly safe to touch. But another marine predator followed them into the lake. 
It's unclear how or when they arrived, but unlike the jellyfish, these anemones did not lose their ability to sting. Ironically, the jellyfish are now prey to the venomous anemones. To feed, and especially to avoid being eaten, most animals rely on some form of weapon or specialized behavior. Most mollusks hide behind thick shells of armor. Other animals, like this pygmy seahorse, utilize camouflage to conceal themselves. Pipefish, a close relative of seahorses, mimic sea fans or corals. Some creatures take shelter in deep burrows, while a few even bury themselves completely in the sand. A number of species also work together to fend off attackers. In this dangerous realm, many animals form surprising alliances. Certain crustaceans are protected by sea cucumbers, jellyfish, or slugs. They catch rides with their larger, mobile hosts, who also stir up the bottom to reveal tasty morsels of food. In addition to meals and transportation, these shrimp have another deterrent to avoid predation. Nudibranchs are poisonous. If it weren't for their small size and inconspicuous habits, these sea slugs would be star attractions of the reef. Unlike their cousins, snails and bivalves, nudibranchs lack a protective shell. They don't need one. Any creature foolish enough to ingest a nudibranch would probably do so only once. Sea slugs are highly distasteful or even poisonous. Bright colors and markings serve notice that their flesh is extremely noxious. But they are not naturally toxic. They actually steal their weapons. Many nudibranchs are immune to the venom of stinging hydroids and anemones, their favorite foods. The venomous cells of their prey are transferred to fleshy appendages on their backs called serrata. When attacked by a predator, the stolen toxins are used to repel the attacker. This is a rare example of the use of an offensive weapon of one animal by another. Thievery and venom seem to work for these sea slugs. They have very few predators. Sea urchins utilize needle-sharp spines to dissuade predators, but their defenses pack an extra punch. Tissue surrounding their spines is highly toxic. Fire urchins are appropriately named. Contact with their spines can inflict pain worse than a third degree burn. Damselfish, crabs, and shrimp find refuge in the stinging tentacles of anemones. Although deadly to many fish, anemones provide shelter to a select group of tenants. These vividly colored clown and enemy fish make their homes in the stinging tentacles of their fish-eating host. 
They acquire an immunity by continually covering themselves with mucus secreted by the anemone. This, in turn, stimulates the anemone not to fire its stinging barbs. Curiously, anemone fish are all born as males. When the need arises, a male will change sex. If a dominant female dies, the largest male changes sex and takes her place, and the largest of the remaining males becomes its partner. There are countless ways to earn a living and protect oneself in this undersea community, and the use of venom remains one of the most effective tools for survival. Tropical reefs and mangroves where sea snakes and other venomous marine animals live are being destroyed at an alarming rate. Coastal development, overfishing, global warming and disease are all taking their toll. The collection of cone snails for the shell trade is also increasing. Millions are sold annually for as little as a few cents each. To date, there are no countries which monitor the collection and trade in ornamental shells. Other venomous animals like jellyfish and many species of scorpionfish are also declining in numbers. We can only speculate on the lost opportunities for new medicines should more species become endangered or extinct. And as most of these animals are predators, it is difficult to gauge the impact on the marine ecosystem should they continue to disappear. They may be key pillars in the undersea food chain. Sea creatures produce some of the deadliest venoms in nature. And although they do injure and occasionally kill humans, they hold enormous potential in the development of powerful new medicines. Around the world, thousands of retired warships are rusting away, toxic nightmares filled with pollutants. What can be done with the aging relics? Cutting up and salvaging scrap metal from these ships is expensive and dangerous. Leaving them to rot, leaking fuel and harmful chemicals into the sea is a recipe for disaster. There is another option. Clean the ships really well, add some explosive charges, and sink them. Once on the ocean floor, former warships transform into vibrant artificial reefs. Marine species colonize these iron and steel structures at an astonishing pace. A Canadian team, the Artificial Reef Society of British Columbia, is attempting to sink its eighth project, the Annapolis, a 366-foot destroyer. But since their first tour of the decommissioned ship, the group has endured years of delays and regulatory hurdles. Thousands of volunteer hours have been invested in the project. Will it finally be sunk? In the Cayman Islands, the Kittiwake met a watery grave while hundreds of onlookers cheered. It's now a popular tourist attraction and a thriving man-made reef. In the Florida Keys, artificial reefs provide new marine habitat and relieve pressure on natural coral reefs. In May 2009, after more than a decade of delays and budget shortfalls, the USS Vandenberg was sunk in the waters off Key West. Sinking massive warships is not without its problems or opponents. Each project has to balance environmental concerns with ever-increasing costs and technical challenges. And sinkings don't always go as planned. The future is uncertain for these reefs of steel.
From all this explosive energy and chaos comes life, marine life, as sunken ships transform into artificial reefs. Within days of sinking, algae begins to grow and invertebrates colonize iron and steel. Small fish gather, and soon apex predators appear, increasing diversity until a complex marine ecosystem is formed. In 2004, members of the Artificial Reef Society of British Columbia visited Canada's Pacific Naval Base on Vancouver Island. They were invited by government officials to inspect the Annapolis, a recently retired destroyer escort. The warship was for sale, but the team wasn't looking to buy it for scrap value or even to keep it afloat. They were planning to sink it as an artificial reef. Here we are down at the ex-HMCS Annapolis, um, just doing a walkthrough to sort of check on the general condition, which gives us an idea of what we've got to deal with for uh, um, preparation, cleaning, um, equipment removal, etc. Here we are in the wardroom. This is, uh, we use it as a lunchroom, but once it was the regal palace of, uh, of the uh, officers of the ship. Most of these ships were all built and they were uh, male only back in the, in the old days. And here we have female heads in wash place. So for obvious reasons, they have their own little space. These would have been all the ship's offices along this side. Um, you know, administration office, engineering office. This is engineers, paymaster's office down this way. Wes Root's business is marine salvage, and he knows boats, especially big Navy vessels. Actually, we'll go up the bridge first. Wes is the project manager for the Reef Society and is overseeing the preparation, cleaning, and metal recycling on a half dozen of these Navy ships. And on the Annapolis, Wes is looking for treasure, metals that can be removed and sold to help fund the project. As far as the salvage value on the ship, of course, it's all recyclable metals. So any of the non-ferrous recyclable metals is where, is, is where any value is, the coppers, the brasses, the stainless steels. You just don't get any better than this. Lots of brass and copper, stainless aluminum. Um, this is what makes it all work. Here we are in the nice, shiny stainless steel galley. Price of stainless steel is pretty high right now, so it uh, definitely helps things. I was gonna get my wife a big soup pot like that because I've got six kids, but she didn't see the humor in it. <laughs> I look around at all the metal and effectively this is what fuels the whole machine. Uh, when we first started doing these ships, I had a nifty old guy helping me through this all. I still remember him going down to the engine room with one of the young guys that was working with us and he went down there and he says, Mike, he says, can you smell it? And he says, what Joe? He says, brass. He says, it's everywhere. <laughs> I haven't done so many of these ships of very similar design. Every time I get into one of these projects, I get on the ship and I go home at night and I wonder to myself, why do my legs hurt so much? And then I realize that I'm on the giant Stairmaster. There's more sets of stairs and all day long you're going up and down stairs. If I've got a hard hat on, I'll knock the hat off a hundred times during the day. But once you work with the ship long enough, you just instinctively know it's like a cat with whiskers. You sort of move along and you can sense that it's there and just dip and rarely do I bang my head. Although salvage work is important to the project, West Root's main responsibility is preparing the ship for sinking. And that requires a zealous approach to removing pollutants, fuel, and other materials that just don't belong in the ocean. The ship's gonna have oil, especially in the machinery spaces. There's gonna be oil spilt on deck plates and underneath bits and pieces. And when we finish cleaning this ship, it'll be clean to the point, not only will you not see any oil, but when we flood the space, there will be no oil sheen on the water. And it takes a very small bit of oil to put a sheen on the water. To efficiently clean this ship, we probably need six months to do the job front to back, given all the little extra time you need for any problems that might arise. As much as it would be financially rewarding to cut this whole ship up into scrap steel, it's a fabulous end of these ships to send them as a reef. Um, we take enough salvage off to finance the job, but uh, this ship will be going for decades as, a, as an artificial reef and it'll be a fabulous sight for both the fish and the divers.
Hopefully the Annapolis will be given a real Vikings funeral as an artificial reef. If not, she'll have the ignoble fate of being towed to a scrapyard in the third world country and just cut into razor blades and the pollutants left on board the ship will end up back in the marine environment. It's a very big concern too from a pollution standpoint, uh, how well these ships are being prepared by people who are out in these uh, scrapyards, uh, simply tearing things apart uh, helter-skelter. Uh, we see that as a, a total disregard for the real benefit use of an artificial reef, like a ship, in terms of usability and tourism. After lengthy negotiations, the Artificial Reef Society acquired this ship a few years after their initial inspection tour. But little did they know the Annapolis project would drag on for nearly a decade. The team was certainly the right one for the job. They had carefully prepared, salvaged, and sunk six of these ships, and even a Boeing 737 aircraft. The first naval vessel acquired by the Artificial Reef Society was the HMCS Chaudière, a destroyer escort. The ship was built in Halifax in the 1950s at the height of the Cold War. After a long and distinguished career as a peacekeeper, it was purchased from the Canadian government for the princely sum of a dollar, plus tax, of course. No one could have ever imagined the Chaudière would serve out her final years on the ocean floor. Such a huge ship had never been purposely sunk in Canada. It was a daunting project, and the ship sinkers had to learn as they went along. When we first saw the Chaudière sitting at the dock in Esquimalt, I thought, this is nuts, this thing's huge. There's no way we're ever gonna turn this into an artificial reef. There's so much work to do. The sinking of the Chaudière didn't exactly go according to plan. These are large ships, and we didn't have a lot of support vessels to help keep it in the right position. And when it started to sink, we had no more control over it. It actually got offline about 70 degrees, and it also sank on its port side. Narrow ships are 366 feet long, but they're only 66 feet wide. So it's easy for them to get top heavy as they start to sink and then roll over. And that's what happened with the Chaudière. Neil's cameras mounted to the ship provided a fisheye view of the action. This is the Chaudière today. 20 years after being sunk, the ship is a magnificent artificial reef. It's lying on its port side on the bottom. It's a lovely wreck. It's more like a real shipwreck in that it's kind of haphazardly lying on the bottom rather than being upright the way the more recent ships have gone down. The Artificial Reef Society learned many hard lessons from their experiences with the Chaudière and later projects. They are now considered world leaders in this unusual field of expertise. Canadians have literally written the book on how to properly prepare, clean, and sink a ship within demanding environmental standards. Dr. Chris Harvey Clark is a biologist and professor at the University of British Columbia. He's an expert on marine life colonization of sunken ships. Today, along with veteran cinematographer and zoologist Neil McDaniel, Clark is making his first dives on two long-established reef projects, the wrecks of the Cape Breton and the Saskatchewan. What do you got in there, gold bars? Yeah, sorry, it's our beer cooler. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad, because it's heavy, that's a good sign. The shipwrecks are located a few miles offshore and are only accessible by boat. Okay. Charter operator Kevin Breckman makes a sizable chunk of his living shuttling scuba divers back and forth to the sites. The wrecks are a fantastic thing, specifically just for the biodiversity and for the increase in marine life. Uh, economically, they're spectacular because it increases not only the sport of diving and the interest in the sport of diving, but the offshoot of hotels, restaurants, just basically the tourist industry. It's just uh, a fantastic thing, and hopefully we can continue to do so. The waters off British Columbia are generally dark and cold, but that doesn't stop most scuba divers in the province. They're a hardy bunch. Well, the water is darn cold here and uh, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so we've got to wear dry suits to protect ourselves thermally. Scuba divers here need a lot of equipment. Heavy weight belts, buoyancy compensators, thick gloves and hoods. 
it can be a bit cumbersome. Uh, the moment of transition. When we go from being land animals to water animals. Mm -hmm. So Neil, I'm really pumped about this. I mean, this wreck's been here for 15 years. It should be absolutely loaded with marine life. So looking forward to the dive. Yeah, Chris, you're gonna like this dive. It's of all the uh, destroyer escorts that have been put down in BC, it's probably the, the richest in terms of marine life. And there's one more piece of heavy gear, the camera. Okay, getting your workout today, Kevin. I am. There we go. You got her? Uh -huh. Okay. That is one heavy frickin' camera. It's good. Good thing you had your Wheaties this morning, Kevin. <laughs> totally. The big thing about sunken wrecks is that they're really a great big sampling device. They sit proud of the bottom, up in the water column where nothing was before. They're hard substrate, and a lot of animals prefer to be attached to hard surfaces, particularly a lot of the invertebrates. There's a controversy about how animals and plants arrive on these wrecks, and particularly with fish, which can swim on and swim off. One school of thought has it that these things are giant sinkholes and all the animals in the area will come and cluster and it'll actually depopulate surrounding areas. There's another school of thought that these are actually amplifiers and a few fish will come and colonize and they'll reproduce and you'll get larger and larger numbers. I'm kind of favoring the second theory. These wrecks are havens. They actually provide a place for these animals to hide for predators, a place where they can lay their eggs, ability to get away from other animals that might be competitors, and of course things settle on the wrecks that they can feed on. So uh, they really, I think, uh, have an amplifying effect. First thing you see is you're coming down the line and this ghostly white appearance coming at you out of the depths, out of the murk. And of course, it's metridium. It's these giant white anemones that are everywhere, carpeting the wreck, and mostly white. There are a few other colors. But they're definitely one of the signatures of the Pacific Northwest and on, on these wrecks. And then, of course, lots of fish. And one of the signature fish we see are the rockfish family. These are these spiky-looking, uh, long-lived, quite territorial, for the most part, fish. And I think, for me, one of the most exciting moments was seeing a species I hardly ever see anymore, the yellow-eye rockfish, which is a long-lived, lives to at least 128 years. After these wrecks sink, they stabilize, the invertebrates are attached, animals are starting to reproduce, fish populations are starting to grow, and that's what we're seeing now in the Nanaimo area. They have, I think, a golden period, and the golden period where they're just loaded with marine life happens in the decades, not in probably the first decade, but the second, third, fourth decade, it becomes loaded with marine life. These wrecks are just probably coming into their golden period now, 20 years on, and we're gonna see massive invertebrate life. The sponges are the thing that really strikes you. When you see a cloud sponge as big as a Chesterfield, that's an exciting thing to see. And all the animals that are then inside that and living in that, that's just a life layered on life. And that's the exciting thing about these wrecks because a lot of them have gone into places that are just a mud sand bottom, reasonably monotonous environment, uh, not a lot of structure, not a lot of hard substrate. And uh, now now we've, we've put these wrecks in and all these other things become possible. So what did you think of that? Beautiful. That was, that was fun. That was a great dive and a lot of diversity and a lot of density of life on that wreck. Everything we put in the ocean is a mixed bag and artificial reefs are probably on the plus side of that mixed bag. Are they absolutely benign? Probably not. Artificial reefs, if they're properly prepared and if they're sunk in the right place, can probably increase biodiversity and provide habitat that wasn't there before. It's not a new concept. People think that you're know, recreating the wheel here. It's not so. I mean, artificial reefs have been used for centuries to enhance marine life, especially fisheries and so on. Using these ships as a place for animals to grow and for divers to enjoy, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think it's a good thing. I mean, there is opposition, obviously, to these projects. A lot of these people, however, have never been on an artificial reef. They've never seen one. We have a very good track record here in BC as far as these projects go. I mean, we're, we're one of the world leaders in doing this kind of thing. A lot of places in the world, they look to BC, to what we've done here, for their inspiration and in doing these, these projects.
you can't just take a vessel out there and you know knock a few holes in it and send it to the bottom. I mean that's not going to do. And I think nowadays uh, there's no public appetite for that. The government's not going to let it happen. And in many of these ships, when they're sunk, they're actually cleaner than, than the bottom of most of the hulls sitting in a marina. I think if it's done properly, uh, ship reefs are, are a great thing for the environment. Retired RCMP explosives expert Roy Gabriel has sunk more ships than most navies. Gabriel has overseen the demolition of a half dozen artificial reef society projects. But we've got to get this tank out of here. You see that or open it up and clean it out and that takes too long. Getting a vessel to the bottom quickly and upright is a technical challenge. It takes experience and lots of explosives. This is a sample of the uh, copper flex linear. It's designed and built specifically for cutting steel. It's RDX explosives on the inside with a, a copper sheeting around the outside. The shape of the charge controls the massive shock wave that's produced. The explosives create an intense narrow cone of energy that slices through an inch of steel plate in the blink of an eye. What we have here is the uh, face side or business side of the explosive charge. This is the portion that will face the inside of the ship and this is where the, it will actually physically cut a meter square hole or a 39 inch square hole out of the side of the ship. The explosion initially forces the steel outward. Water pressure pushes the plate back in and the ship floods. It usually takes weeks to plan and assemble the explosives that sink a big naval vessel. A dozen or more custom designed panels blow meter square holes in the ship. They're carried, sometimes down several levels to the bottom of the ship and fitted into place. Let me get one in the other side here. Okay, that'll stay there, Bruce. Each of the charges is built to fit precisely against curved hulls. For the flex linear explosives to work effectively, they need to be an exact distance away from the steel. When the engine room boiler room go off, to start with, these charges would jump right off the ship because there's so much shock wave and twisting going through the ship as it fires. All of this timber basically just gets, you know, blown into chipwood. Sinking an enormous warship requires that the explosive charges be precisely timed, fired in pairs inside the ship's hull just below the waterline. A tiny margin of error separates an upright artificial reef from a dangerous wreck sitting on her side, or in the worst case scenario, completely upside down. This is the former USS Spiegel Grove, an artificial reef in the Florida Keys. It's now a major scuba diving attraction, but it had a very troubled beginning. It's a good example of the potential risks and what can go horribly wrong when you sink thousands of tons of steel. After cleaning, the 510-foot, 5,400-ton ship was towed into position for final preparations. But on May 17, 2002, a day before she was supposed to sink, something went wrong. No one knows exactly why, but it began to sink prematurely. She was not only sinking, but she started to roll over and turned upside down. Air was trapped in the keel and the ship bobbed at the surface. The Spiegel Grove was now a shipping hazard. Getting the ship to the bottom and hopefully on her side was the first priority and it needed to be done fast. Salvage teams were brought in, new holes were cut in the hull, and enormous balloons were used to help get the ship turned over. Once on the bottom and resting on her side, Hurricane Dennis intervened. The storm was serendipity indeed. Not only did it help push the ship over, it gently placed it upright, an event no one could have even remotely imagined. The Spiegel Grove is now a great example of what can go right with an artificial reef. It's a haven for marine life. 
fish and encrusting invertebrates cover the ship. The wreck is a huge success, but critics of artificial reefs question how they affect the environment, fish populations, and natural reefs. The Spiegel Grove is part of a long-term study on the impact of artificial reefs. Lad Akins is the project manager of REEF, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. The Spiegel Grove is in a very unique position. Uh, it's in a sand bottom area, away from the reef, but somewhat close, uh, let's say within a quarter mile of nearby natural reef areas. And I think the intent was to put it far enough away that even if it moved a little bit, it wouldn't damage the natural reef but also close enough so that there could be interaction between the marine life on the natural reef system and on the wreck itself. And I think we're seeing a lot of that. We're in year four of a five-year study right now, looking at the fish assemblages, not only on the Spiegel Grove, but also on the adjacent natural reef areas. And we've really seen some great stuff. Uh, over 170 species of fish on the Spiegel Grove itself. There are a number of potential uses for these ships, one of which is placement as an artificial reef, but it has to be done properly. They have to be cleaned. There need to be studies done of what's in the area and what the potential impacts could be. And we really need to be careful about storm damage and deterioration of these structures through the years as well and think well in advance. Not just right now, what's it gonna do, but in 20 or 30 or 50 years, what's it gonna be doing? So I think when done properly, a ship placed as an artificial reef can be a very good thing. That's not to say it always is, though. In Virginia, Texas, and California, hundreds of mothballed ships are part of the U.S. Defense Reserve Fleet. Some of the vessels are in good enough shape that they can be activated for duty in national emergencies. The oldest, most decrepit hulls are generally slated for recycling, but for many of the ships, their ultimate fate remains uncertain. Some are just too toxic with pollutants to scrap, while others are simply not valuable enough to bother scrapping. Even though it wasn't the largest in the Virginia Reserve Fleet, the USS Vandenberg was chosen for a unique project in Key West, Florida. The Vandenberg Project was conceived back in, I guess, 1996. We had been put on notice as a community from the National Marine Sanctuary that they were going to allow us to put a large shipwreck down here in the sanctuary. And so we made a decision and we picked the Vandenberg out of an inventory of about 400 ships. We liked it because of all of the top side structure. We figured it would hold more fish that way. And it was listed as a low hazmat ship suitable for artificial reef. So we wanted a clean ship. It was cool looking, it was big. Those things kind of drove the decision. Several years into her retirement, the Vandenberg looked a little worse for wear. But she was destined to join several other successful artificial reef projects in the Florida Keys. The Vandenberg, from a historic perspective and recreational perspective, will complete the southern leg of the Florida Historic Shipwreck Trail. This one will be easily accessible for glass bottom boats and snorkelers, as well as scuba diving and fishing. So uh, it's something that everybody can participate in. Our reefs are struggling, as they are worldwide. And this project, we worked with the local maritime resource people and the National Marine Sanctuary to design a reef that would be attractive enough to physically move recreational pressure off of the natural reef and put it onto the artificial reef. Uh, it's designed specifically as a management tool for the sanctuary. As Sink Day approached, curious crowds gathered at the Key West Pier. It was a big event, unlike anything the community had ever experienced. It's not often that you sink a 500-foot ship on purpose. Right up until the last minute, there was still an enormous amount of work to do. To understand the work that's been done to bring this ship fully compliant with a very strict and hundreds of pages of long best management practices from the EPA, the, the Marine Sanctuary, Florida Fish and Wildlife, Florida DEP, and there's about 18 different government, local, state, and federal agencies involved. 
It's very difficult, if you've never been through this, to understand the absolutely breathtaking amount of work that it takes to get this, this, this kind of project done. There's machinery, uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel, cleaning all the systems, pulling out vents and doors and a million feet of wire. We're working 12 and 14 hour days straight through to get her ready and, and have her properly prepared, fully compliant, ready to be deployed. For Key West, it means uh, we have a ship that's going to produce about $6 million worth of revenue for the Monroe economy, about a half million dollars in sales taxes, and uh, 191 new jobs in the middle of a recession, and that really uh, works well for us down here. It's always a bittersweet reunion for former sailors, but most servicemen agree that sinking a beloved ship and keeping it intact is preferable to it being cut up for scrap. I joined the Vandenberg in 1964. The ship was originally built as a mobile platform, so she was a mobile radar station. You couldn't put land-based radar stations every place in the world, but you could move the ship just about any place you wanted. The people on board did the data collection, and their job in doing that was to get as precise data as possible. I, we used to joke and say, we could track a basketball at a distance of 500 miles. The Vandenberg was important uh, because it contributed a lot of data on both American missiles and foreign missiles that was used throughout the Cold War in determining the balance of terror. Did we need more sophisticated missiles? Did we need bigger missiles? And by the same token, what were the Russians doing? What were they building? And how did they work? Uh, all that kind of information came from this ship. Uh, there's Russian wording above my head because this ship was a movie set for a movie called Virus, where it played the part of a Russian missile attacking ship. Okay, and it did a good job. I mean, they, it was a B-movie, but they made money on it. It's a memorial plaque for a friend of ours that died a few years ago. It was a former instrumentation manager out here. Really good guy. And uh, hopefully his ashes will end up somewhere around here after it's sunk. It's nice to see the old rust bucket again. And uh, it's going to be very nice to see it sink out there and become something useful again. And I think turning it into a reef for fishing and for diving and things is a, is a positive outcome. As with all Navy ships, whether they're American, Canadian, or other nationality, military ceremonies are usually solemn affairs. Countless sailors lived and died on these once proud warriors. We had a memorial that honored my husband, Jack Steele, for his service on the Vandenberg, and it was touching. Observers made the trip to the sinking site. Boats were allowed to witness the historic event from a safe distance. There's a certain electricity in the air when a big ship sinks. A spectacle like this is unlike anything most people will ever see. or how precisely the explosives are timed, 
there's always a nagging apprehension that the ship will roll over. It can be an extremely tense few minutes. The ship sank in less than two minutes, one minute, 44 seconds to be exact. The demolition team did an outstanding job, but even they had no idea the Vandenberg would sink so quickly. Awesome. It looked to me like it's supposed to look. I've seen a lot of these big ships sunk, and it really, it really looked like everything went the way it was supposed to go. The next day, dignitaries and participants headed out to the new dive site for a first look at the ship. a lot of current running this way. The wreck site is now one of the most visited scuba dives in the world. A tremendous success story. With the scuba diving crowd, the new artificial reef is a huge hit. Finally, we have the Florida Keys wreck trek completed. The sinking of the Vandenberg is absolutely phenomenal. We have wrecks starting in Key Largo all the way down to Key West that are world class. There's nowhere else in the world that divers will be able to experience what they're getting in the Florida Keys. Economically, it is great for the entire Keys. The pre-bookings for the summer, even into this winter, are off the chart. I've dove all over the world. This is one of my better dives that I've ever had in my life. I'll continue coming back here, and it's a great opportunity for everybody also in, in the whole world to see what a beautiful artificial reef we've dropped down here. It's the best thing we've done in a long time. I think it's exactly what we planned it to be. I think it's the world's best wreck dive. That is fantastic. I think we, what do we have, 70 feet of visibility down there today, maybe 60. Real clear water, a little bit of current, and there's just a lot to see. It's just, it's just incredible. Everywhere you look, there's some other cool part of the wreck sticks up at you. I think the Vandenberg will live up to all the promises that, that have been made. One of the Caribbean's most popular tourist and scuba diving destinations are the Cayman Islands. While a handful of shipwrecks here complement natural coral reefs, divers on the main island of Grand Cayman longed for a big new shipwreck of their own. Their prayers were answered with the long-awaited arrival of the USS Kitty Wake. We picked the Kitty Wake from a fleet of about 300 ships in that were in mothball. We toured a lot of the ships. This ship was a great ship because it had a great history in the Caribbean already. It served some time in the Falkland Islands, recovered the black box, the Challenger explosion. So it had a good history. It's only going to be 15 feet from the surface, so you're going to have a lot of beautiful snorkeling adventures and then also diving adventures are going to be endless dives. The day before the sinking, ex-sailors and tourists were allowed to visit the retired submarine rescue vessel. It had been nearly 30 years since former navigator John Gladstein set foot on the ship. When was the last time you did that, David? <laughs> been a while. Let's, uh, let's go back to the recompression chamber. All right, these are the recompression chambers. This had a hat. There's the hatch here and there, and they could decompress this side, leaving the inside uh, at full compression, and pass supplies in and out, and whatever they needed to do, people in and out, whatever they needed to do. Making an artificial reef out of thing like this, so uh, rather than uh, reclaiming the steel, uh, uh, I don't know the science, but it seems obvious to me that it's better. This ship was always intended to serve divers, and this ship existed to serve divers, and it's great that she's going to continue to serve divers. For project manager Nancy Easterbrook, the Kitty Wake endeavor was a labor of love. It wasn't always a smooth process, but finally getting the ship to the bottom safely and upright would be a huge relief. Tomorrow we're finally going to sink her. 
I've been elated by this project, frustrated by it. I have been uh, overjoyed and all kinds of other things, but the only thing that's ever really scared me is to get her on her spot down in the ocean, upright, where she's supposed to go. But you know, we got good people doing this. All precautions have been taken, so I'm really very excited about tomorrow and cannot wait until we get her down in the bottom as the new diving attraction and snorkeling attraction for the Cayman Islands. The sinking of the Kitty Wake was a unique project. Unlike artificial reefs in Canada and Florida, the ship had to be sunk without the use of explosives. The Cayman Islands are one big marine park, and the sinking site was shallow and close to shore. The percussion of explosive charges can kill fish and other reef creatures in the vicinity of the sinking. So instead of using explosives, the ship had to be flooded manually. Strategically placed holes, both for flooding and for diver access, were cut along the side of the hull. Early on sink day, the hull of the Kitty Wake was flooded. Heavy pumps filled the ship with seawater as curious onlookers started to gather for the big event. Once the surrounding sea started to overflow the newly cut holes, the ship went down very quickly. Just minutes after sinking, a few divers were allowed underwater to take a look. The ship landed almost perfectly upright, a great relief to project organizers. Not surprisingly, small fish immediately moved on board, using the superstructure as shelter. And not long behind them, big predators like this barracuda ventured onto the ship. In a short period of time, the Kitty Wake would become one of the top attractions in the Cayman Islands, both for fish and for tourists. This is the HMCS Annapolis. Workers are frantically preparing the ship for sinking. Howie Robbins first toured the Annapolis in 2004, scouting the ship as a potential reef project. When we first inspected the Annapolis back in 2004, we were thinking this was an extraordinary new opportunity, simply because the Annapolis was such a different ship compared to the other ships that we had already sunk. Fundamentally, the Annapolis has about 40% more exterior surface area, and that's due to the helicopter flight deck and hangar, and a few other features as well. Although it's the same length and width as our previous vessels, we believe the Annapolis offers a lot more habitat uh, space, which we think will be uh, beneficial for marine life. The Annapolis project has been fraught with problems, the first of which was the global financial meltdown of 2008. Scrap salvage is the main source of revenue for projects like these, and metal prices plummeted. Even with budget shortfalls and countless delays, the Annapolis project soldiers on with the help of hundreds of dedicated volunteers. Each weekend, they head out to the ship, cutting access holes, cleaning compartments, removing debris and scrap metal, whatever it takes. Our best estimate is we have over a thousand volunteers over a three and a half year period and an estimated 17,000 hours uh, put into the project. With just a week to go before a scheduled October 2012 sink date, the ship is still not quite ready. There's more cleaning required, oil and grease to be removed, and most of the diver access holes are not yet cut. 
tons of scrap steel and other metals remain on board. There's at least two more months of heavy labor to be done. Strict new environmental inspections may now delay the sinking well into 2013. Set to sink in a sheltered bay just a few miles from downtown Vancouver, the Annapolis project has also been plagued by protests and opposition. Many people feel that sinking a ship on purpose is akin to throwing a big tin can in the water. Garbage disposal on a grand scale. Every time you do something out in the marine environment, there are going to be people who are for it and people who are against it. And it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about aquaculture, about sinking a, a shipwreck. Is the sum total of what we're doing when we sink these ships, is it good or bad? I'm not an unbiased person where this is concerned. I think uh, for, from my viewpoint, uh, it's probably a better thing. It's a substrate, it's a place for animals to attach. And if we understand the wrecks can be a haven, then other places can be as well. Uh, we have high hopes for the Annapolis. I think she's gonna be uh, well-traveled and well-visited. And also, she's going into an area that's kind of mud sand bottom. Undoubtedly, she's gonna become a magnet that will attract, retain, and amplify uh, marine life in the area. With more hard work and a bit of luck, the HMCS Annapolis will soon be resting on the seafloor. For now, like countless other warship relics, it awaits an uncertain fate. When it does sink, the Annapolis will serve its final mission as a reef of steel.